We're going to take a look at some of the striking structures out here at the Garden Home Retreat and pick up some ideas that you can use where you live. It's all coming up next. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about blurring the lines between inside and out. Now today we're going to talk about structures and the importance of them in this garden as well as, well, many different gardens I've designed. You see, structures not only allow me to create beautiful pictures, but they also help me divide up the space and use those spaces more efficiently. Take for example the raised beds in the vegetable garden. These simple to construct boxes go a long way in making this very large garden more manageable. Not only that, but they're time and labor savers. We're able to create a specific soil mix by blending potting soil with organic humus and existing garden soil. And well, just look at the results. From spring through summer and certainly into fall, these beds just keep on giving. And from organizing in the garden to creating order inside, we'll look at this clever shelving system made from recycled house shutters, plus an overview of some of the interesting structures on this property and ways you can integrate ideas like rustic trellises, arbors, fountains, and much more into your garden home. Okay, let's get going. We'll start with the grape arbor. We're well underway with construction on the house, but I have to say I'm very happy that we got started with the garden about a year before the house started. And Angel loves that too, because she loves running in the garden, don't you girl? You know, one of the most important structures here is this arbor. It makes such a difference in the way the garden lays out. It was important to me to build them large enough to accommodate vehicles that could drive through it. So this particular arbor is seven feet tall, it's 10 feet wide and 40 feet long. Now there's another one on the opposite end or the east end of the garden. Now the terminus that I used down there is the big fig and here we're using a large cast iron urn to be the focal point at the end of the arbor. Now this is some pretty serious construction. The size of the members here, both the ones that create the arch and the side, well, they're solid. In fact, this thing <laughs> could be playground equipment. Now what I like about it is when they built it in the shop and brought it out here, it was already pre-painted, and then they anchored it on top of a concrete footing, so it is here to stay. Now as you can see, I'm growing grapevines over it, and I plan to use this in lots of ways. One way is just to walk through and see all the beautiful iris and nasturtiums that I plant under it in the spring. And in the fall, well, it's going to be a great place to set up a table and have friends out and enjoy an alfresco dinner. I've been inspired by so many of these type structures that I've seen in my travels, like the one in Holland at Hetlow Palace. Now that's a very impressive structure. Mine is a little more modest, I think. But you know, color is so important to me as a designer. I wanted something that would blend with every color you can imagine, and that's why I used that classic comfort green on it. Now, the other reason I painted these arbors is that it will help the metal stand the test of time. Recently, I had an opportunity to go to Memphis, Tennessee and speak to Jim Wallace at the National Ornamental Metal Museum. Iron by its nature is going to rust. It, it's just going to happen in there. And uh, you have to live with it. But what we can do is, is retard and to mitigate it. And if the piece is going to be an interior piece where the environment is relatively stable, low humidity, then we can use waxes and oils to do this. When we do that, we're going to be able to see the richness of the surface, the pores where they've been opened up when it's been hot. Each file mark is going to be showing up. And for fine iron work, for fine metal work, that's the way you're going to go. If it's going to go outside and you're going to have your iced tea on it, then paint is where you're going to have to go. Paint is, you know, spend some money on quality paint. Don't, don't chintz. Use a good primer and a good paint, and it'll last a long time. Okay, now let's move from ornamental ironwork to another form of metal, which is more functional. 
let's turn our attention to the roofing material we're using out here at the garden home. It's another example of green thinking because of its durability. Even though the final roof hasn't been installed yet, you can get an idea of what it's going to look like by just glancing over to the barns. You see, the red metal roof really fits into the architecture of the region, and it's one of our goals out here to make the buildings look as though they've always been a part of the landscape. Most people are choosing metal roofing for the appearance, the durability, and the longevity. Anywhere from 50 to 100 years. Metal roofing typically costs more than other types, but when you factor in the life cycle cost, it far outweighs the disadvantages. This is a 29 gauge double lock standing seam. Each panel has a male and female seam, and they interlock directionally. When we put one on, we have to seam the female side and clip the male side to hold it down. We're hand seaming. Double lock standing seam panel is one of the oldest forms of metal roofing. It has a interlocking fold that's folded over twice and that makes a weather seal. Uh, it also makes the wind load very high. It takes a severe wind to blow it off. This type of roof brings a, a warm rustic appeal, which is what they're looking for at this site. It's also used pretty widely commercially on schools and uni universities. It could also be used on any type of modern home, cottages, lake houses. This roof brings a old world charm from maybe 50 to 80 years ago. The color on it matches the colors that they typically painted roofs back then. And the type of roof itself is the same type of roofing they used back in, in those times. If you've never grown sunflowers, well, you've missed out on one of life's great joys. They're one of the easiest flowers to grow as long as you have medium, well, reasonably good soil and full sun. They really need lots of sun. This is sort of the last round of sunflowers that I have here in the garden this year. I've had three successive crops, and each time I've planted some different varieties. Just look at this big guy here. This one's called Giant Mammoth. You can see why it takes that name. The sunflower is called the sunflower because the way it turns its head toward the sun, and the bloom itself looks like a sun with its beautiful yellow ray petals resembling the rays of the sun. Now, if you think sunflowers are strictly yellow, well, you're in for a pleasant surprise. Take a look at this little guy. This is an example of one called Moulin Rouge, named this for its red, almost mahogany-colored blooms. Now, what I like about this plant is that it does take you into a whole nother color family with sunflowers. Now, this is a small bloom, I have to say, because we're here at the end of the season. Earlier in the year, I had some that were almost five inches across. I've grown lots of other varieties here, such as the Italian whites and one called teddy bear, which is adorable. You know, kids love sunflowers, especially the little teddy bear because it's so cute. But they also like these great big ones because of their sheer size. There's something magical about them, almost Jack and the Beanstalk-esque. Now, I've had kids out here throughout the construction project where we've planted sunflowers as well as gourds, and they get a big kick out of them. One of the things that I want to mention to you is that if you're starting a garden for the first time, sunflowers are great as a backdrop or a screen. Just look at the heights of these. Some of them are as tall as seven feet. These things grow so tall, so fast, you can create garden walls. Pretty exciting, huh? Certainly, garden design is an art form, but it's one that actually grows and gets better with time. Here you see a relatively young garden that I've been working on. Now, what I want to point out here is while the garden is still very young, you can really begin to see some of the important forms in the structures. You can already see the important role they're playing from the raised beds and garden walls to the gate and the pergola. Designer Ward Lyle, who's been assisting me on the design of the cottage at the Garden Home Retreat, also teamed up with me to design this garden. He stopped by to talk to us about some of the crucial elements here. When we first got involved in this project, they just removed a tennis court from this area and there were still sections of chain link fence. There was an 18-wheeler trailer used as a job site office. In addition, we had 
generators and a dog pen on just the other side of this wall right here that we had to contend with. It was just chaos and this was exposed to the pasture and it just really didn't feel like a desirable place to be. And it was trying to figure out a way to make this backside of this guest house become the best part of the garden instead of the worst part of the garden. And that's where the idea of creating a wall garden came from, just out of sheer necessity to deal with all these issues. The whole property has been transformed from what was once an open pasture out in the country. And now that the uh, development is creeping in, we've used the screening devices to block out the signs of development. So we have a hedge enclosing the property when you first come in, just a loose informal hedge. And then where the, whereas the house was originally a building sitting in a field with the additions to the house, it's now a much more complex set of structures. So we've used enclosure and plantings to help sort of break down the spaces and define them into smaller units. It's sort of the divide and conquer principle. So in some areas we have hedges, in some areas we have fencing, and in some areas like this wall garden, we use a combination of the new structures and walls in order to define a space. And it was decided to leave the pasture as pasture and just wall this off and have a little private garden for intense gardening with perennials and more color and limit the amount of gardening you have to do rather than try to work it into the landscape itself. And the wall helps, to, it keeps deer out, it keeps dogs out, it keeps noise out. In the winter it acts as a microclimate and lets you grow plants that are marginally hardy in this area. There's a hierarchy of enclosure, it's the loosest and most informal out of the property line. And then as you come into the buildings it gets more defined and more crisp. So within this garden, we're defined on two sides by an eight-foot wall. And then within the garden itself, we have paved paths and defined areas for planting for the uh, perennial garden. And then to help sort of balance the blousiness and the sort of frothy nature of the perennials, we've, we've put in low boxwood hedges to give some structure and order. We're in the middle of planting it right now. We've gotten our green structure in, and we've just started adding the perennials in. So it's just a matter of you know, enclosures on a, a series of scales, all the way from the broad to the specific. I don't know about you, but I really enjoy a creative, if not playful, expression of an old idea, and that's exactly what we have here. You see, this is an example of a medieval knot garden. Now these knot gardens were laid out at the California State Filoli near San Francisco. And what's amazing to me about it, in just a 35 foot by 35 foot square, they've created a magnificent articulation of just four plants. Here you have germander flowering with its medium pink blooms, juxtapose dwarf red barberry. In the center, the silvery Santalina creates a design in the middle. And at the four corners in the middle of this design, we have myrtle. Now what makes this so interesting visually is the way the plants are clipped, as though one is tucked under or woven under the next, hence the name a knot garden. It's a series of knots, of strings, but in this case, it's of bands of plants. Now over here behind me, you can see another design articulated with some of the same plants, but some different ones. Here you have head cut lavender around the edge, there's our friend Germander, the red barberry, and in the center is Whorehound with its silvery color. And on each corner is a lollipop of rosemary, tightly shorn. One can only imagine how old a rosemary plant like this must be. Just look at the size of the trunk. It really does look like a lollipop. But you know, I have to say, while this is fantastical, the most whimsical and amusing part of this garden is right over here. Just take a look at a miniature form of this knot garden laid out in this box. The same color pattern is here. You have the burgundy reds, you have the silvery grays, and that light green represented in boxwood here, whereas before it was in myrtle. You can tell that these things require a great deal of pruning and interpretation to be successful. And the silver colored one is as beautifully articulated. Now these are just a few examples of the many wonders that you can see here at Filoli. But this structurally impressive design element can also be applied to smaller properties. Here's an example from a garden in Germany, and another in a Charleston garden designed by Price and Louisa Cameron. Of course, the strongest design element in this garden would be this series of parterre gardens that run right down the 
axis of this part of the garden. Price chose the plant material for its contrast and it's basically in the shape of the St. Andrew's Cross. They're the first things that you see as you come out of the house. Well, they're dramatic and I love the three different varieties of of holly or what I would say a mouse-eared plant because they have that small little ovate leaf. I see you have the Cronada holly around the edge, the Japanese holly, some sort of boxwood, I guess, Kingsville. in the center. Kingsville box. And which then is germander. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. Three different colors of green working together. And I have fun with the topiary in the center. Little, little whimsy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. Now, I see you've bordered this in brick and you've created a raised bed. I like the orientation of the brick, flat at the edge and then standing on the end to create a raised well, bed. Well, that was easy to do because we need a drainage for the plant material. So we just thought of barely bedding it in concrete. The brick that you've used to create this, they look ancient. They are old and we dug them up ourselves from underneath this section of what is now lawn. There used to be a 70-foot brick outbuilding here, and this was the patio or paved area in front of it. I see. And you won't believe what else we dug up in this garden. We've dug up bricks and all sorts of artifacts, which I'd like to show you. Wonderful. A bit of, a, a bit of archaeology here in the garden. Oh, and it's so much fun. I'm still finding things. Louisa, I was only expecting a few things. I mean, this is amazing. All of this came out of the garden? All of it, and I have buckets more. <laughs> My heavens, look at this. That looks like a coin. It is. It's a George II coin. I took it to a coin expert. Well, that certainly dates the house, doesn't it? Does. It does. And what is this? That is the escutcheon from a soldier's cartridge box. I see, right. To, to wear soldier. over here on the belt. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And look at all these shards of pottery. And this looks like a little doll of some sort or a little statue. She's wearing a liberty cap and I think it was a doll baby. How interesting. And this is this one I found just when I was sweeping up. It's another doll, China doll, with a bonnet on. So you, you find these objects frequently when you're working in the I garden. found this one just last month. <laughs> Amazing. So bit by bit, the garden reveals her secrets. It does. <laughs> the construction phase of the Garden Home Retreat, I've been doing a little construction myself. Take a look at this little project. I don't know about you, but I need as much storage capacity as I can. I'm talking about storage within storage. I've got these wonderful tool sheds, but in them I need some place to store my tools. So what I've come up with is this little system. It's basically two old shutters that I'm recycling that I bought in a junk shop, okay? Then you have four boards one on each side, it's one by 12 pine, one on top, one on the bottom, and then if you open this up, you can see that I've used pegboard on the back, and all I have to do is put these brackets in and I'm ready to go. Now, what's left to do here is I want to put a coat of paint on it, and this is freestanding so I can place it in the tool shed and move it around anywhere I want, and it's just going to be a great place to keep all of those garden tools organized. <music> Welcome to the Design Studio. This is where we take photographs that you send in of your property, and then I give you some ideas that you may want to use to improve the landscape. Today, we have a photograph from Alabama from Clay. Clay has a nice looking house here, the craftsman style looks like it's from the first quarter of the 20th century. And what he'd like to do is do something that's a little non-traditional. And I've, I've got a few ideas that might just come into play here. I think these shrubs are a little overgrown here on the corner, Clay, and you may have that there for a purpose in that it provides you some screening if you're sitting out here on your porch, but what I'd like for you to do is just think about maybe pulling that out to the corner. If you could imagine that group of shrubs here on the corner of your property, and then with a low, let's say, boxwood hedge that runs all the way across like this, where we create a sense of entry. I would probably replace this lantern with something that's maybe a little more to the period of the house, and I would go taller with it, and then remove this, it looks like a Carolina jasmine, because it's gotten completely overgrown, and I would probably grow a Madison jasmine uh, because of its sweet fragrance up on the pole or even a clematis. 
I'd also carry that boxwood hedge all the way down to the other side, then come back with a sasanqua hedge, beautiful fall blooming camellia along this side here. Now that means you could take out this holly if you wanted to and bring the sasanquas all the way down and this would give you an opportunity to plant maybe a camellia japonica here which would give you beautiful flowers in the winter. Now let's talk about this mondo grass that's coming around the base of the house like that. I think you can leave that, it's very traditional, but if you want to do something different, if you took that out and expanded your bed just to this point here, all the way around, it would give you a little more room and you could plant this all in dwarf gardenias. Again, the fragrance would be fantastic. Now, a couple of suggestions on paint color. I think that what I'd like to see is this darker. Notice this white, it really pops at the foundation. And just look what a difference it makes removing the white like this. I think it could really help. And probably what I would do, Clay, is take this shutter color. Now, it may be black, it's hard for me to tell here, but I would apply that color down here and that anchors the house. Now, these are just a few suggestions and I, I hope they help. <laughs> A greenhouse is one of those structures that can easily be dominated by function. Function can override form, but this one is rather stylish. You see, this model is one based on the 19th century. It has Victorian overtones. Just take a look at the spine that runs down the top of the greenhouse. Now, it's about 10 by 15 feet, which is a perfect size. You can't believe all the things that I can grow in here. And what I've done, because I use lots of containers and set them around, I've created a hedge all the way around it. So it's really sitting within its own room. Now, some of the other structures out here at the Garden Home Retreat include birdhouses. You see, housing out here is not just for me. It's also for wildlife that calls this place home. Throughout the fields, we've placed bluebird boxes and also a martin house. Now, you may not consider a flagpole structure, but I do. What a great focal point in the landscape. What we tried to do is choose one that was large enough, both the pole and the flag, that it seemed to be just the right size for this place. You see, scale is so important. This one is made from white pine, and we mounted it into the ground by boring a hole and using concrete to anchor it. This baby should be set for years to come. Now let's move to the front of the property. Here we wanted to say welcome with this pair of entry pavilions and this gate. Now these really do accomplish that, but you don't have to have something this big for your property. In fact, I designed a garden in New Jersey where this charming house was accented by placing a simple gate at the entryway. I flanked each side of it with some evergreen boxwoods, which provide a backdrop for seasonal color. Now this is an effective way to bump up the charm factor. Now the barns play such an important role out here at the Garden Home Retreat. And I have to say, these structures have seen a huge makeover since we took over ownership out here. They've changed in size, color, and even function. And we can't disregard the house itself. It's the largest element in the landscape. And I can't wait for it to be finished because then everything is going to come together beautifully. <laughs> As we close the show, I'm struck by how this broom corn serves as a form of structure, a backdrop, if you will, for all of these beautiful zinnias. You know, structure is such an important part of creating, well, exterior design spaces as well as the interior. And oh, we can't forget about those green components we saw on the show, the importance of long-lasting metal roofs as well as garden ornament that will be here for a long time. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. We're talking about green ideas for the home. Now, I don't mean paint the home green. I'm talking about environmentally friendly ideas that you can put to work. We'll start the show off by talking about bricks. You see, these are an ancient building material and they're still some of the most effective. 
We've got ideas for you that will help transform your home into a garden home. More of the ideas seen in this program can be found in Alan's Garden Home series of books. Viewers can follow Alan through four seasons of Living in the Garden Home, his fourth book, which is filled with projects, activities, and decorating ideas. Alan's book, 60 Container Recipes to Accent Your Garden Home, is like a cookbook for gardeners with step-by-step -step instructions. P. Allen Smith's Garden Home follows Alan through the process of building his garden home and explains the 12 principles of design. Allow four to six weeks for delivery when ordering toll-free at 866-359-7004. Funding for P. Allen Smith's Garden Home is made possible by the following. Proven Winners. Proven Winners selects plants for their color, beauty, vigor, and flowers that last from spring through fall. You'll find Proven Winners plants in their signature white containers at garden centers across the country. The Pro Mix Ultimate Collection of Growing Mixes from Premier. The quality of your potting and planting mixes is the foundation of your garden's performance. The ProMix Ultimate Collection of Growing Mixes from Premier. Steel, dedicated to helping make yard care easy with a full line of handheld power equipment, sold and serviced only by your local steel retailer. DuPont, makers of DuPont garden products, including landscape fabrics, available at Lowe's. United Industries, makers of garden-safe insect control products, on the web at gardensafe.com.